Chapter 14 is going to be about fitness and physical activity. The goal for fitness is to have enough energy to be physically well enough to be able to meet the everyday demands of life and then still have leftover energy in case you have anything unexpected come up. This is referring to, for example, any additional stresses, whether it be extra physical stress, there's something that you need to do that is different from your uh, everyday ordinary life or emotional stress, mental stress, whatever it may be, but having enough energy to be able to handle anything extra that's thrown your way without being completely winded. Now, the different components that make up physical fitness are flexibility, your muscle strength and endurance. You'll also see this referred to as resistance training, and then cardiorespiratory endurance. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at these three different components, as well as how to use each component as part of a physical fitness plan. So here we have the guideline for how to develop a fitness plan for yourself. These are the recommendations of the American College of Sports Medicine. So we're starting off with the three categories that we just discussed, the cardiorespiratory, the strength, which inclu includes the muscular strength, endurance, stri uh, resistance training that I mentioned, and then the flexibility. So let's go ahead and take a look at the recommendations for each one. Starting off with the cardiorespiratory. These are going to be activities that use your large muscle groups in a repetitive pattern. And this is going to be something that's going to benefit your heart muscles as well as your lungs. So it's going to be something that you want to do on a regular basis. The minimum recommended is five days, but if you can do seven days, that's even better. The intensity that you want to stay at is moderate intensity and for at least 30 minutes a day. This can include either going to the gym and getting on a treadmill or other things that you enjoy that aren't necessarily exercise, like dancing, hiking, swimming, um, playing a sport like soccer, football, any kind of uh, physical activity that's going to use your larger muscle groups instead of a targeted muscle is going to usually be included in this category. Now, the second category we have is our strength or resistance training. These are exercises where you are pushing against some form of resistance. For example, if you think about holding a dumbbell in your hand and trying to pull that upwards, when you do that, you are trying to push up against the weight of the dumbbell pulling downwards towards gravity. And so you are pushing against the resistance of that dumbbell. So this is going to include things like, like weightlifting, like the example I just gave. But also you can use your own body weight as part of uh, these exercises. For example, when you do a push-up, you are pushing your own body weight up against the pull of gravity. So that's also against resistance. If you are using a pull-up bar chin up, and doing chin-ups where you hold onto the bar and are trying to pull your body upwards, that's also trying to push the weight of your body up against the pull of gravity. So those are other things that can be done in the strength or resistance training that don't necessarily include lifting weights. Now for this one, you want to do two to three days a week. And you want to try to spread them out throughout the week and work different muscle groups so that you don't injure yourself. For the flexibility group, this is something that if you can do every day, it's going to be even better for you. But the bare minimum is going to be two days a week. And this can include things such as just your regular old stretching or things like yoga also are going to help with your flexibility. This is a really important category because it's going to help you with your posture, with your balance. It's going to help you prevent injuries when you're doing the other two categories that we discussed. 
Now we mentioned in the previous slide the different levels of intensity that you want to stay within. For example, for cardio, we said you want to do moderate intensity for at least 30 minutes. This chart over here gives you a way for you to be able to determine your level of intensity without having to use any kind of device. So for example, starting off with the light intensity. Light intensity is going to be if you try to sing and you're able to sing without your speech being broken up, then that's going to be light intensity. If you, are, if you try to sing and your singing is broken up, but when you try to just have a conversation, just speaking, your speech isn't broken up, then that tells you that it is moderate intensity. If you can't even speak without your speech being broken up, then that is vigorous intensity. So that's just one way to be able to determine how intense your exercise is so that you can adjust it based off of where you are. The way that we are going to use these different categories to develop physical fitness is by using the progressive overload principle. And what this is referring to is constantly pushing your body past its comfort level by increasing one of these three categories that we have listed here, frequency, intensity, and time. So for example, maybe you used to do the exercise three times a week. Maybe now you can start doing it four times a week, increasing frequency. Maybe you used to lift 30 pounds, now you can push yourself to lift 35 or 40 pounds once the 30 pounds gets comfortable. That's increasing intensity. And then time, maybe you used to go for a 30 minute jog, now you can push yourself to do 40 minutes. So there's lots of different ways where you can increase the difficulty of an exercise to make it so that your body is not getting comfortable, the exercise isn't getting too easy. This is something that you're going to consistently increase as you get more physically fit and that's going to be how you're going to be able to build more muscle and maintain your physical fitness. Now as you do the progressive overload principle, your muscles are going to get bigger and stronger and that's what we refer to as hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is when your muscles enlarge and become stronger. But if you feel like you've reached the point where you're comfortable with your level of fitness and you stop using those muscles, those muscles are going to get smaller and weaker again. And that's what we call atrophy. So atrophy is something that we want to avoid by maintaining physical activity. A few things that I want to mention before we get into the details of each of the different types of exercises is that you want to do your best to minimize injuries. And the way that you can do that is first making sure that you are active all throughout the week. This doesn't necessarily have to be a vigorous exercise routine, but just so that you are moving your muscles, blood is flowing through your muscles, this is going to prevent injury from shocking your muscles into physical activity when they've just been dormant all week long. Another thing that you can do is make sure that you are using the right equipment and wearing the right attire. So you don't want to go for a run with flip-flops, obviously. You want to make sure that you are wearing the right type of shoes, for example. And then also using proper form, making sure that your posture is correct, that you are lifting with the right muscles so that you don't injure yourself. You also want to make sure that you are warming up and cooling down. Again, you don't want to shock your muscles from going from one state to the other. And this is going to be something that you can do for about 5 to 10 minutes would be best for both warm up and cool down. And lastly, just be smart when you're exercising. Pay attention to your own body signals. If something doesn't feel right, go ahead and stop or take it down a notch. If it feels painful, again, take it down a notch. You don't want it to be painful. It can be a little uncomfortable, a little difficult, but if it's painful, then that usually means that you are injuring yourself. Now moving on to the different categories, we're going to talk about 
um, your cardio respiratory and your strength or resistance training in a little bit more detail. So starting off with your cardio respiratory category. We said these are the activities where you are using your larger muscle groups or what we also call aerobic activities. We said these are going to help increase the health of your heart and your lungs and there are a few different ways that they're going to do this. Now one thing that's going to happen is your heart is going to become healthier. Your heart is a muscle so as you're doing the cardio exercises you are working your heart, your heart rate is elevated, and that is going to make it so that your heart becomes stronger and better at pumping blood. So you're going to have better circulation because your heart is able to pump blood uh, more efficiently, but also because of that, your heart rate is going to have slowed down, your blood pressure will drop, because your blood pressure is basically referring to how hard your heart has to work to pump the blood around. And if your heart is healthier, stronger, it's not going to have to work as hard. So your blood pressure can drop from being a uh, physically fit using cardiorespiratory exercises. Now also, your, when your blood is circulating more efficiently, blood is something that delivers oxygen to all parts of your body. So if your blood circulation is better, you're going to have better oxygen delivery to your muscles, which is going to make your muscles work at a better rate. They're going to work more efficiently and your breathing is also going to become more efficient as well. Now, in order for you to get those benefits that we just listed, you want to make sure that your exercise is more than 20 minutes long. And the reason for this is because once you hit that 20 minute mark is when you start to benefit from those um, cardio, heart benefits and the lung benefits that we just discussed. Those don't kick in until you work them for at least 20 minutes long. And so you want to make sure your activity is at least that long, but you also want to make sure that your heart rate is elevated. If your heart rate is not elevated, then that means you're not working your body hard enough for your heart to actually benefit and become stronger. So the main guideline is to make sure that your heart rate is elevated, but still make sure that you are at moderate intensity. You want to figure that out by making sure you can still have a conversation without your speech being broken up and then maintain it for more than 20 minutes long. The next category is the resistance training or the strength training that we discussed. Now the main purpose of this, remember we said you're pushing against resistance and when we do this we are making our muscles work harder which is going to increase our muscle mass, the muscle size and the muscle is going to become stronger and be able to work better. But the other thing that resistance training also does is that it also helps strengthen your bones. Just like when you put strain on your muscles, your muscles are going to undo their structure and rebuild to become stronger and bigger. Same thing happens with your bones. When you put stress on your bones, your bones kind of go through their own turnover where they become stronger. And so when you are pushing yourself against some kind of resistance, you are pushing your muscles to become stronger but also your bones as well. And that's going to be really important for when you are older and you're worried about losing your bone mass as what happens when people get older. But if you are maintaining your physical fitness through resistance training, then your bones are going to be in much better shape. Now, lastly, you can alter your resistance training based off of what your main focus is. If you want to increase your muscle strength or your muscle endurance, you're going to have to alter your exercise in, in a different way. When we talk about muscle strength, we're talking about how hard your muscle can work. So for example, how much weight can you lift? When we're talking about muscle endurance, that's referring to how long your muscle can work before it becomes fatigued. So in order to 
improve your muscle strength, what you want to do is push against higher resistance or uh, lift heavier weights and less repetitions. If you want to increase your endurance, you want to lift lighter weights but do more repetitions. So again, strength, higher weights, less repetitions, endurance, lower or lighter weights, more repetitions. Next thing we're going to look at is the fuel that is going to support these activities. And we already learned about ATP or adenosine triphosphate. We said that this is the way that our body stores energy. And when you first move any kind of muscle in your body, any kind of movement, that's going to be what your body uses first. It's going to use the energy that it has readily available for itself, which is ATP. Now, we don't have much of this just hanging around in the body, so it's only really going to support our activity for a few seconds. That's all that it's going to last for. Now, after that, we have something called creatine phosphate. And what creatine phosphate does is it actually donates its phosphate group to ATP. Remember, ATP is used up when you remove a phosphate group. Once you break off one of the three phosphate groups, the energy stored in that phosphate bond gets released and your body can use it. And then you have a DP, where you have two phosphate groups. Again, you can break off a phosphate group and release that phosphate bond, uh, the energy in the phosphate bond. Now, we also talked about how you can recycle ATP by adding phosphates back on to rebuild it into the full ATP structure again. So let's say that you used up the ATP, you broke off those phosphate groups. After that, creatine phosphate is going to come in and donate its phosphate group to the used ATP structures. Now they can be a fully formed ATP again, and you can break the new phosphate off and use the energy that way. So the role for creatine phosphate is to replenish the phosphate in ATP so that ATP can last a little bit longer. Now after that, we are going to have to rely on our bodies metabolism cycle to make more ATP. Remember, we don't have much just hanging around. We can use that little bit for a few seconds, but then we need to start making more ATP. So here we're going to go ahead and take a look at the different types of fuel, the different nutrients that we're going to use through the metabolism cycles to make more ATP. Now this chart over here basically summarizes it all for us. So we started off taking a look at the top row where you see we have using ATP and creatine phosphate because those are available immediately as soon as you start moving a muscle, but you'll see that they only last a few seconds long. So after that we need to start making more ATP by going through metabolism. Now, if you remember, when we discussed metabolism, we said that there are two pathways that we can go, um, that we can go through, which are anaerobic and aerobic. We said that the body prefers aerobic because we make a lot more ATP that way, but it's a very long, lengthy cycle. So when you need energy immediately, you're going to want to use the anaerobic pathway. It only makes two ATP at a time, but the cycle is really short and quick. So this is going to be really important when you have very high intensity exercise, because when you're doing something that is very intense, you're using a lot more energy per second. And so you are using up your energy stores really quickly which means you need to replenish them really quickly. For example, if you are, let's say, going for a sprint, 
you're going to be running at your highest intensity, your highest speed. You're going to be using a bunch of energy per second. So you're going to need to provide your body with really quick sources of energy. Whereas if you are going for a leisurely walk, you're not using up much energy per second. So your body has a lot of time for it to go through the long steps of the aerobic pathway and eventually give your body a large amount of ATP. So again, just to recap, very high intensity exercise means we need to give the body energy quick, which is the anaerobic pathway. Lighter intensity, we can go through the aerobic pathway because we're using up our energy more slowly so we can replenish it more slowly. So now that we have that down, we can go ahead and take a look at the next row where it says we have really high intensity exercise, the type of exercise that can only last a few minutes long, between 20 seconds to a few minutes. This means you're usually putting uh, pretty much your maximum effort into the exercise, which means you need energy quickly. And that is, remember, your anaerobic pathway. And if you recall, the anaerobic pathway is the Cori cycle, which is the conversion of glucose to pyruvate to lactate, and then reversing that over again. So one thing you'll notice is that it says ATP from carbohydrate, but in parentheses it says lactate to notify us that this is anaerobic. Because again, the anaerobic pathway is starting off with glucose, so that's why it says ATP from carbohydrates. Glucose comes from carbohydrates. And then it converts it to pyruvate and lactate. So when ATP is uh, made from carbohydrates in the anaerobic pathway, we are converting glucose to lactate. So that's what you see there. Now, after that, we have our intensity um, decreasing. And so now we're getting to the levels where our exercise can last for several minutes long. We're not putting in much intensity. And so it's something that can last for maybe up to 20 minutes long or longer. When you're using your energy up that slowly, you have time to go through the long steps of the aerobic pathway. And remember, if the body can choose the aerobic pathway, it's going to choose that because that's its preferred method. So as soon as our intensity is low enough to have time to go through the aerobic pathway, we're going to switch to aerobic. And that's what you see happening in the third row. But one thing that you'll notice is still it says ATP from carbohydrate. And the reason for this is because even though we're now going through the aerobic pathway, the body is still going to choose carbohydrates for its fuel source because remember, glucose is our body's preferred fuel. It prefers to run off of glucose more than anything else. So if glucose is available, then we're going to use glucose first, even if it's aerobic. But one thing you'll notice is that it says ATP from carbohydrate, but it doesn't say lactate in parentheses. And that's because in the aerobic pathway, we do not make lactate. So that's the difference between row two and row three. Now, after this point, where if you have gone over 20 minutes long and you're still um, exercising, Usually this means that you have dropped your intensity level a little bit for you to be able to continue for a longer period of time. And what actually happens at this point is your body's going to start thinking twice about using glucose. And the reason for this is if you remember, we can run off of other fuel sources for the most part, but the brain and red blood cells need glucose specifically. So while you're exercising and using ATP from your carbohydrates, from your glucose, you're using up what's in your bloodstream, and then you're going over to your glycogen stores and getting glucose out of there and using that for energy. But 
you don't want to completely empty your glycogen stores because once they're empty, you have no more glucose to fuel your brain and your red blood cells, and that means your body's gonna shut down since your brain controls your bodily functions. So we wanna reserve some glucose to keep our brain functioning. And so if you continue past the 20 minute mark, your body's gonna start thinking, okay, this person is still exercising, it doesn't look like they're stopping anytime soon. I need to start sparing some of this glucose so that I have enough for the brain and the red blood cells and we can keep functioning. So the next choice is going to be fat. We have three nutrients that we use for fuel. Carbohydrates in the form of glucose, fat, and then protein. But remember, protein is something that we only use for energy when we're absolutely desperate. Because if we use it for energy, that means we're breaking down our muscle and other body tissues. So we don't want to use that. So if we are wanting to save the glucose for just the brain and the red blood cells, the next thing that we're going to choose is going to be fat. So as your intensity drops and you continue past the 20 minute mark, usually what your body will start doing is using less glucose and more fat for fuel. That way the majority of your body is running off of fat and then your glucose is feeding your brain and your red blood cells since they can't function off of anything else. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at each of these different fuel sources in a little bit more detail. Now one thing that I mentioned is that um, when you continue your physical activity past the 20 minute mark, usually your body is going to start switching over to using fat so that it can save up the glucose for your brain. But one thing that happens is if you continuously exercise past the 20 minute mark, your body actually adapts and starts to function more efficiently by switching over to fat earlier in the process. So basically, it's going to be thinking, okay, this person always exercises past 20 minutes, and at the 20 minute mark, I always have to switch to fat and start saving that glucose. So why don't I start saving glucose earlier in the process? And so your body will start saving up glucose and using more fat at maybe the 15 minute mark instead of the 20 minute mark. So this is something that your body um, can really benefit from if you exercise regularly because you are basically causing your body to start burning more fat, more of your body fat, earlier in the process. Now another thing to take into consideration is that when your glucose eventually finishes, that's going to be when you can no longer function anymore because your brain, your nervous system need glucose to function. So even though your body is trying to keep you going for as long as possible by only using glucose when necessary, eventually your glucose stores will empty. And once they empty, your body is no longer going to be able to function. That's something that a lot of runners experience as what is called hitting the wall, where they just have to stop, they can't go anymore. And this is because they have uh, continued exercising for so long enough, uh, for so long that they have completely emptied their glucose stores. Now, there are ways around this. If you are somebody who is going to be doing some kind of endurance activity, Endurance activities are activities that last for a long time, usually more than an hour long. So if you're going to be doing some kind of activity for more than an hour long, then one thing that you can do is bring with you some kind of glucose source. Remember, glucose comes from carbohydrates. This could be a food or a beverage, but the recommendation is for every hour, you want to consume 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates. So let's say you've exercised for an hour, you want to still keep going, eat or drink something that has between 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates. 
if you're a smaller female who has lower calorie needs, you're probably going to be closer to the 30 end of that range. If you're a larger sized male who has really high energy needs, you're probably going to be closer to the 60 gram mark. Now, there are several things that you can use for that. Sports drinks have glucose in them so that they can help you replenish that um, glucose that you're using up. That. That's one of the reasons that there is sugar in there. Or you also have, um, for example, if you want something to just pop in your mouth really quickly and not an actual snack or food item, there are supplemental chews. For example, uh, Gatorade makes, um, I think it's called an energy chew or a glucose chew, but it's basically this little uh, chewy block that you can just pop into your mouth and chew, swallow really quickly, and it's going to give you enough to continue for another prolonged period of time. This is something that you can keep up to maintain your activity because as soon as the glucose is out, you're not going to be able to continue. Another thing that you can do to help yourself with um, being able to continue exercise for a longer period of time is eating a lot of carbohydrates after your exercise. What actually happens is your um, glycogen stores, remember glycogen is the way we store glucose, we store it in our liver and muscles. And after you exercise, your glycogen stores are actually expanded more than they usually are. And they can fit more glucose than usual. And this lasts for about two hours after exercise. And if you consume a lot of carbohydrates within these two hours after exercise, more of it is going to be able to be stored as glycogen. Now this is something that is going to be primarily beneficial for people who are going to be exercising or training multiple times in a day, for example an athlete, because let's say you exercise in the morning and then after your exercise you eat a carbohydrate meal with a lot of carbohydrates, your body's going to go ahead and store a lot more of it as um, glucose than it normally would have been able to. Now you have a lot more glucose that you can use for fuel, which means you're going to be able to last longer before your body basically stops functioning. So a few hours later in the afternoon, you're going for your second training of the day, and now you're going to be able to last a lot longer because you have stored a bunch of glucose by consuming a high carbohydrate meal after your first exercise. So that's something that you can also take advantage of. Now, because of how important carbohydrates are, how important glucose is for keeping you going, you'll notice that over here with this study that was done, looking at the different types of diets and which one was the best for endurance activity, you'll see that the high carbohydrate, one, um, high carbohydrate diet was the one that lasted the longest. They looked at a fat and protein based diet, a normal mixed diet, and then high carbohydrates. And individuals who were on a high carbohydrate diet were able to exercise for a lot longer. And remember, the reason for this is because once you are out of glucose, your body is not going to function anymore. So the more glucose that you have stored, the more your body is going to be able to um, continue for time-wise. Now moving on to using fat for fuel. Now we mentioned that our body will switch over to fat usually at the 20 minute mark so that our body can basically save up that glucose. But one thing that you want to remember is the higher the intensity, the less fat is going to be used. Because as you increase your intensity, you're using up more energy per minute. And the more energy you use up quicker, the body's going to have to replenish it quicker. 
And the quick way to replenish energy is the short anaerobic pathway. The anaerobic pathway begins with glucose, then to pyruvate, then to lactate. So if we're starting with glucose, that means the anaerobic pathway uses carbohydrates. Glucose comes from carbohydrates. So for the anaerobic pathway, fat is not going to be able to be used. We are only going to use carbohydrates in the anaerobic pathway. So if our intensity is really high, we're going to have to switch to using anaerobic, which uses glucose. Now we also talked about spot reducing a little bit in one of the previous chapters. We mentioned that um, when you try to target fat loss in a specific body part by exercising that body part, it's not something that is going to be effective. You're not able to um, choose where you want to lose fat. Your body is going to do it in the most efficient way for itself which is releasing fat from where you have it stored the most. So it'll be different for everybody. The one exception to the rule is your aerobic activity. When you do aerobic activity like the cardio that we mentioned, that is going to target the fat cells in your abdominal area. So if you want to lose fat from your stomach area, that is one way to target it. The last one that we have is protein. And you might have noticed that in the chart that showed us the um, different fuels that we were using, we didn't have protein listed on there. And that's because protein is not something that is really used for the most part when it comes to physical activity. And that's because if we use it, we're breaking down our muscle and tissues, and we don't want to do that. And so we're going to... Um, try to prevent our body from using protein as much as possible by using the other fuels first. Now there are situations where your body will be forced to use protein for fuel, but it really is a very small amount. It's maximum usually about 10% of the amount of energy that your body will use. Now the times where this will happen is usually in the endurance activities. Remember, we said endurance is the long-lasting activities. Your body is going to try to keep you going for as long as possible by switching over to using fat and saving that glucose. But remember, we said eventually your glucose is going to empty. It's Even though we're trying to spare it, eventually it's going to be used up and your body's not going to be able to function anymore. Now... Your body tries to keep you going for as long as possible by trying to make more glucose just before you're completely empty. So basically when your body realizes we're about to finish up the glucose stores, the body's going to shut down, it's thinking let's try to keep us going for a little bit longer. And one way that it can do that is by making its own glucose. And if you remember, the way that the body makes its own glucose is by converting our glucogenic amino acids, which come from protein, into glucose. So what it will start to do just before you're empty when, if, of your glucose stores is it will start doing gluconeogenesis, which is making glucose out of your protein. But the problem here is we don't have protein stores. So in order for your body to do this, it's going to break down some of your muscles, some of your tissues, and take the amino acids that made up those structures and convert those to glucose. This process isn't really quick, so it's not going to be something that's going to keep you going for much longer, but it's something that happens usually towards the very end of the um, the very, very end of the endurance activity before your body shuts down. It's your body's last ditch effort to keep you going. It'll do this for a little bit and then you'll not be able to keep up and your body will shut down. So um, for people who do endurance activities, they will use a small amount of protein towards the end of your activity. Now, if you keep getting to this point where you completely empty out your glucose stores and you end up shutting down, 
your glucose stores actually adapt, your glycogen ad adapts, and it's basically your body thinking, okay, this person is constantly emptying out the glycogen consistently, we keep running out of glucose, we need to find a way to store more glucose as glycogen. And so your body actually adapts and starts being capable of storing more glucose. So that's another benefit of exercising regularly. Now, because with these endurance activities, we are using a little bit of protein towards the end, uh, these individuals who are doing endurance activities regularly are gonna need a little bit of extra protein in their diet to make up for that bit that was used towards the end for energy. Now, we also have our strength and resistance athletes. So for example, people who are lifting weights, bodybuilders, they also need extra protein, not because we're using protein for fuel, but because when they are putting that extra strain on their muscles, what happens is the muscle undoes its structure and then rebuilds to become stronger and bigger. So in order for the muscle to recover and rebuild itself after the exercise, you need to have extra protein to help build that muscle structure over again. And so both endurance and um, strength athletes are going to use uh, a little bit of more protein, they need a little bit more protein, but both of them for different reasons. This table here shows us the recommendation for protein depending on whether the individual is an athlete or not. Starting off, we have 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight for adults who are not athletes. For um, the American male, that averages out, averages out to be about 56 grams per day. Now, underneath that, we have for our strength athletes, like the bodybuilders, their recommendations are higher for the reasons that we discussed. So it says 1.2 to 1.7 grams uh, per kilogram of body weight, which for the average U.S. male is equivalent to 84 to 119 grams. And then lastly, we have our endurance athletes who also need a little bit more, 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram of body weight, which is equivalent to, on average, 84 to 98 grams of protein per day. Now, the very last row shows you how much the average male in the U.S. consumes on a daily basis, and that is, on average, 102 grams per day. Now, if you take a look at that, that is much higher for, than the RDA for males who are not athletes. If the athlete is um, a strength athlete, it's right there smack in the middle of that recommendation. If you look at the recommendation for the endurance athletes for males, 84 to 98, the average intake is even higher than that. So what that tells us is that the American population is actually consuming so much additional protein that even if they are athletes and their needs are higher, they're probably already getting that extra amount that athletes need, even if they aren't athletes. Um, if they aren't, for example, we said that the um, strength resistance was in the middle of the range. Let's say the person is on the higher end of the range. That little bit of protein, those few extra grams of protein that, that are needed, can be, uh, can be gotten in the diet by just adding a little bit of extra protein in the form of food. So when it comes to all of these protein shakes, protein meals, bars that all these athletes are usually consuming, it's really not necessary because they're probably already getting more than what they need in the first place. And if they're not, they're probably close enough that they could just get it from regular food rather than a protein shake. And this is important because remember, our body can't store excess protein. So if you give your body more than what it needs, 
it's going to be converted to fat and stored as fat instead. Now going on to supplements, other supplements that athletes tend to take, starting off with vitamin E. Now one thing that we haven't discussed so far is that um, is the concept of free radicals and antioxidants. For now, I'm just going to give you the general idea so that you can understand this concept here, and then we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later. So basically, free radicals are things that can develop in your body that will damage your muscle and your tissues. Antioxidants protect you against free radicals. When you put extra stress on your muscles, one thing that can happen is your muscles start to produce these free radicals and then the free radicals can damage your muscles. Since athletes are constantly putting extra strain on their muscles, they usually produce a bunch of free radicals and these athletes are worried that the free radicals are going to destroy their muscles. And so a lot of them will take supplements of vitamin E because vitamin E is the strongest antioxidant. And remember, we said that antioxidants protect us against free radicals. Now, the problem here is that our body has its own uh, way of adapting and creating this protective barrier against the free radicals. But if you are constantly giving your body an outside source of protection by constantly giving your body vitamin E, then your body's not going to feel the need to adapt and you're not going to have that extra protection against free radicals. And what they actually did see is for athletes who are taking vitamin E versus ones who are not taking, the ones who were taking vitamin E actually had more damage from free radicals than the ones who weren't taking it. Because the ones who weren't taking it, their body adapted and created a protective barrier. The ones who were taking the vitamin E, their body didn't get a chance to adapt. So it's actually better to not take the vitamin E supplement. Another common supplement is iron. And the reason for this is because a lot of people tend to think that it's going to increase their performance because iron is something that um, basically carries oxygen in your blood. And for your muscles to function well, they need oxygen. So people tend to think the more iron they consume, the more oxygen is delivered to their muscles, which means their muscles are going to work better. That's not the case. If you are deficient in iron, then taking the supplement will help you work more efficiently, will deliver more oxygen. But if you're not deficient, it's not going to do anything. Your body's actually not even going to absorb it. Now, for certain individuals, it might be a good idea to take a supplement because these individuals tend to be more deficient anyway. For example, um, vegetarians or vegans, because getting iron from your animal products like your meat is going to give you um, iron in a more readily absorbable form. Basically you get iron a lot easier from animal uh, products like meat than from your plant sources. So sometimes vegans and vegetarians can suffer from an iron deficiency. Also young women who are menstruating because what since iron is part of our blood when you lose blood, you lose iron. So if a woman is menstruating, she's losing iron every month. If she's also a vegan or vegetarian, she has double risk. So in those situations, an iron supplement um, might be a good idea. But besides that, not really necessary. Another reason some athletes take iron is because of something called sports anemia. Now, remember iron is in your blood in the red blood cells. Red blood cells don't live forever. They live about three to four months long and then they naturally die off and your body makes new ones. When they get closer to the end of their life cycle, closer to the three, four month mark, those red blood cells start to get a lot weaker. And when you're putting additional stress on your body through exercise, 
the ones that are getting close to dying, they're already weak, will go ahead and die off all at once. And if you test your blood at that point, it will look like you have anemia, like you don't have enough red blood cells. And for that reason, people will go ahead and take iron. Since iron is a lack of iron is usually the cause of anemia. But the problem here is that iron deficiency is not the reason that you lost those red blood cells. So taking extra iron is not going to help your body actually speeds up the process of making extra red blood cells when the other ones die off. So it's really just something that's temporary. As soon as they die off, the body's going to start making new ones, and before you know it, you have enough blood cells. And so sports anemia, which is what um, we call the situation, is just a temporary condition. It does not require iron. It does not require any treatment at all. Next we have water consumption. Water consumption is very important. Uh, we already know why it's important to make sure that you are hydrated in general, but when you are exercising it's even more important because water is something that is going to help regulate your temperature. Basically the way that your body regulates your temperature is by allowing you to sweat. When you sweat the sweat evaporates off of your skin and that cools down your body temperature. That's your body's method of regulating your temperature. That's the main reason that you sweat. If you are not hydrated enough, you're not going to be able to sweat sufficiently in order to regulate your temperature. And you can end up with a heat stroke or what we call hyperthermia. Now, another thing that can also happen, um, before I talk about how you want to hydrate, another thing that can also happen um, is that you uh, maybe had enough fluid in your body before, you sweat completely fine, your body's able to regulate its temperature, but then after you finish exercising, your body has used all of its fluids to allow you to sweat. So now it doesn't have much fluid left over. So you need to make sure that you are replenishing your fluid that was lost through sweat as well. And that's where this hydration schedule comes in. This shows you how to make sure that you are hydrated enough so that you can sweat properly, but then also hydrated enough so that you can replenish the body fluids that you lost. So it tells you two to three hours before your activity, drink about two to three cups of water, 15 minutes before, about a cup or two, and then during your activity, you also want to make sure that you're sipping on water. The reason we want to spread it out like this is because if you try to consume a bunch of water just before your exercise, it's going to feel really uncomfortable, your body's going to start cramping as you exercise, and you don't want that to happen. Now, after your activity, your body has lost a bunch of fluid through sweat, so you want to make sure that you replace that. And the way that you're going to do that is weigh yourself before the exercise and then weigh yourself after. And for every pound of body weight that you lost, you're going to replace it with two cups of water. So let's say you weighed yourself before exercise. You were 130 pounds. After you exercise, you weigh yourself again, you're 128 pounds. So you lost two pounds during your exercise activity. That two pounds is fluid loss. So remember, for each pound, you want to drink two cups of water. So for this person who went from 130 to 128, they lost two pounds. So for each pound, two cups of water, which is going to be a total of four cups of water to replenish their fluids. Now for the typical individual, water is completely fine on its own to replenish your fluids. A lot of people tend to think that sports drinks are necessary and the reason for this is because when you sweat you lose something called electrolytes as well in your sweat. In the fluid that is released. 
and sports drinks contain these electrolytes. So a lot of people tend to think that because you sweat, you need to drink a sports drink to replace the electrolytes. But for the typical individual, you don't need it. You can drink water, and then the next time you eat a meal, that meal will contain enough electrolytes to replenish what you lost. Now, for people who were sweating excessively, let's say you had a really intense long workout, you were sweating a lot for a long period of time, and then maybe you went and sat in a sauna as well and sweat even more. In those kind of situations, a sports drink is a good idea because you will have lost a bunch of electrolytes, and it's a good idea to help you get them quicker. A few other reasons that sports drinks could be a good idea. For some people, the flavor is something that promotes them to drink more water. So if they, um, if just drinking normal water, they're not able to drink the amount that they need to replace all their fluids, but they can easily chug down a sports drink, then that's going to be something that they can do so that they can make sure that they get um, the fluids that are necessary. Another reason is um, that it's something that can uh, replenish your glucose. Remember, we said for people who are going um, more than an hour long, they need to replace their glucose. Well, sports drinks, the non-diet version, have the right amount of glucose in there for you to replenish replenish what you're losing gradually as you sip on that um, on that drink throughout your activity. So that could be a good idea for people who are doing endurance activities. All right, now the last thing that we're going to look at is the meals that you want to be consuming, the type of foods you want to eat before or after your exercise. Now, there are um, different kinds of foods that you can include in your meals that are going to make it so that your body is going to be able to function better and you're going to be able to benefit better from your exercise. Let's start off with before your exercise. What you want to do first is make sure that you are consuming your meal about four hours before exercise, if it's an actual meal. If it's a snack, an hour or two before is fine. But the reason for this is because your stomach takes about four hours long to completely empty itself. And if you are trying to eat foods that are going to help you during your activity, that are going to fuel your activity, they need to first leave your stomach, enter your intestines, and be absorbed. After they're absorbed, they can be used. They're not going to do you any good sitting around in your stomach. So if you consume the meal four hours before your exercise, you've given it long enough to leave your stomach and be absorbed into your body where it's ready to be used during your activity. Next thing, high carbohydrates. Remember we said if you consume a good amount of carbohydrates, you'll be able to last longer because once you're out of glucose, you can't function anymore. So you want to make sure that you're getting your carbohydrates. Protein is something that you can consume a little bit of. It's always a good idea to include some protein in your meal since protein keeps you feeling full, but you don't want to consume a large amount of protein. You just want a small, moderate amount of um, good quality protein just so that it keeps you full for those four hours. Now, the things that you want to avoid are going to be, um, first, you don't want to be excessive, you don't want to overload your body, or you're going to start being sluggish. So between 300 to 800 calories is a good range for the meal. Again, if you are smaller female, lower calorie needs, maybe closer to the 300 mark. A larger male with higher calorie needs, probably closer to the 800 mark. You also want to make sure that you are limiting your fiber and your fat because these are two things that are going to slow down the emptying of your stomach. And we don't want to slow it down. We want it to hurry up and leave the stomach so that it can be ready to be used during exercise. So again, to recap, the 
pre-exercise meal, the meal before exercise. Four hours before, 300 to 800 calories, high carbohydrate, low fat, low fiber. Now, for the meal that you're going to consume after exercise, it's basically going to be the same thing. You still want to get your high carbohydrates. You still want to limit some of your fat and your fiber. But what you do want to consume in addition is going to be the extra protein. This is going to be where you want a good amount of high quality protein. During your exercise, your body actually stops building muscle, stops protein synthesis, but it really speeds it up after your exercise. And this is going to be where you need the protein to rebuild any muscle that was torn down so that your muscles can be stronger, bigger. And so after your exercise, you want to go ahead and add on some high quality protein. So the only, only difference really between the pre-exercise and post-exercise meal is that the post-exercise is going to include some extra high quality protein. Remember, we still need that uh, high carbohydrate after the meal because we want to replenish all of the glucose that we used up during the exercise.